Hey guys, this is Vince Miller. I'm excited you're joining us. Today we are in chapter four of our study through the book of Ephesians. Now the content of Ephesians I think is timeless content that has a whole lot to say about our relationship with God and others. Today's topic is can't we find some unity? <laughs> now, before we dive in, please do me a favor, hit that subscribe button below so that you can get notified when new videos come out in this series. And you're gonna wanna get informed so you don't miss out. So do that right now. Also, do me another favor. Sometime today or this week, head over to the website today at beresolute.org. That's beresolute.org and do two things for me while you're over there. First, sign up for the men's daily devotional. Hit that daily Devo button. I write a new one daily for men just like you and they are always short, sweet, and to the point, right? Second, while you're over there, pick up some all-in gear like the hat I'm wearing here or the ones you see behind you, all right? Support the mission and the message that I live for here, which is to live all in for him who lived all in for us. So grab a shirt, grab a hat, grab a sweatshirt, sport it, share it with others. And if you wanna snap a pic and share it with me over on Facebook or Instagram or wherever you socially gather, I would of course greatly appreciate that. And with that, let's dive into the lesson for today from Ephesians 4, Can't We Find Some Unity? Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but there is a lot of division in the world today. We are divided about, well, everything. <laughs> We're divided about race and safety and politics and education. We're divided about the economy, social issues. Uh, even our right to gather in public worship has become a topic of tension and polarization. Many spiritual leaders are divided on this issue, right? There are some leaders who, well, are fighting for the right to gather in public worship. On the other hand, there are leaders planning not to gather publicly until sometime in the unforeseeable future, right? And if spiritual leaders cannot agree, don't you wonder if we can agree on anything anymore? This makes us all wonder, I think, if unity is even possible. Take things like music and entertainment and sports that used to really bring us together, <laughs> but that doesn't seem to be the case any longer. Just take the National Football League, for example. Football used to give us something to unite around. They got our minds off the division and the challenges of our world. But today, football games are becoming a reminder of our deep division. Kneeling, standing, propaganda, right? Racial tension, even team mascots and their symbols are evidence of our division. Our former diversions are now only reminders of the division that we're experiencing in the world. But here's the hope. Right in the middle of a moment like this, we encounter Ephesians chapter four. And Paul invests an entire chapter showing us believers how unity is possible. Here are three things that Paul says about unity. First, unity is established only by God. Only by God. You know, as we are getting fatigued by all the division in the world, I believe we're craving something and someone to unite us. I think in the back of our minds, we've all been hoping that someone or something in this world would bring us together, but clearly, that's not the case. Media is not going to provide it. Our leaders are not capable of providing it. Politicians and governors are definitely unable to provide it. But we're still searching for it, and we still want it. We want something to unite us, to unite under. And I believe people out there know this. Therefore, there are groups of people who are trying to get us to unite under their ideas. And because they want to get our attention, they use polarizing and negative messaging to get our attention, right? But the tone and the sound of their messages only perpetuate hate and discord. And let's be honest, we're all getting exhausted by this. I am. And I'm discovering, like many of you, that discovering unity is hard to come by in our world. And why is this? Well, that's because true unity is only found when we look beyond ourselves. We must look beyond 
creation itself and the malicious human desire to find the unity that we really long for. We need someone outside of ourselves to unify us. Let me illustrate it this way. Since we've already talked about football, let's use the game of football as an example. On a football team, you got 55 players rostered and, well, you got 32 teams in the league. At any one time, though, there's only 11 on the field. But these men are each gifted in different ways, all playing to one end. They want to win. And this game can be beautiful when played by clearly determined rules that create unity for all the teams and their players and the coaches. But someone's got to determine the rules to the play. And this is how unity happens in very diverse and competitive environments. But unity must be determined by someone given authority over the game, not the constituents themselves. Left to themselves, these guys on the team would be killing each other, which is why the game has to be regulated by a league and a commissioner, whether you like them or not, or even agree with them or not. And so when it comes to unity, Paul, when writing to the Ephesians, tells us that someone must provide us with the unity we seek. Someone, well, outside of the self, outside of ourselves. And it's God that provides it. He decides the rules to the game. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. It's amazing. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of us all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, Paul is crystal clear that unity and oneness is possible for believers but it has certain, well, requirements and prerequisites. Unity begins with submission to one God, one Lord, and one Spirit, right? Unity is accomplished through one hope, one faith, and one baptism. Unity comes through humility, gentleness, patience, peace, and love. And all of this is determined by someone greater than us. It's God. While we want to play by our own rules, only God determines the rules and therefore has the potential to bring some unity into this world. But it requires submission to someone greater than us. Left to ourselves, well, this world would feel like chaos. Need some evidence? Just turn on the stinking news, right? Second, second, unity never nullifies our uniqueness. Unity never nullifies our uniqueness. Now listen to what Paul says about our unity and our uniqueness. He says this, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You see, there is diversity and uniqueness on God's team while living under the sovereign rule of God who unifies. We still have some uniqueness, and this is because unity of purpose does not mean uniformity of the person. Let me say that again. Unity of purpose does not mean uniformity of the person. I bring something to our unity in Christ and so do you. In fact, some of you need to hear this. You are needed and unity in the body is not possible without God. But in another way, it's not possible without you. We are here to build up one another and to attain this unity together, not individually. I've sometimes said it this way. I need you and you need me. <laughs> and when I use my gift, you are blessed because my gift is for you, not for myself. And because of this, when I use my gift, you are blessed. But I need your gift too because your gift is not for you, it's for me. Let me give you an example. I had someone write me a note on Sunday, which was my birthday. It was the best note I received. I got it from a stranger, actually. Someone I don't even know. They said this to me, almost verbatim. Happy birthday, Vince. I know you don't know me, but I want to tell you thank you. 
I've been reading your daily devotional for two years every day, and they are the best part of my day. Keep doing what you're doing. Now, here's why this note was so cool. I was using my gift, which is speaking and writing, to bless his life, but he used his gift, encouragement, to bless me. While I don't tell many people this, one of my ongoing life struggles has been discouragement. Therefore, when I receive a note of encouragement or affirmation, this just fills me up. And this note of all the notes I received on my birthday, this one was by far the most emotional and spiritual and powerful. And for me, this illustrates the reciprocating power of uniqueness in achieving godly unity. Third, Third, unity requires activity. Unity requires activity from you. So if we want to strive for unity, there is something we can do. And it's relatively simple and hard all at the same time, right? Listen to what Paul says in the latter part of chapter four. He says this, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. You know, I believe God is doing a new work in the people of the church, in us as believers. And at the present, we can't let the issues of this world and season divide us. We must not let ideologies built on fear establish themselves against the purposes of God. We have to Be certain to check our personal agendas and fears and opinions against the will and the word of God. If we don't, we will just end up seeking our way, right? And our visions and our ideologies and our purposes. This is not how a believer conducts himself. We must not let our selfish desires take priority over the desires of God. This is how a person of the world acts. It's not how we act. And this is what makes unity challenging. But here is what Paul says we can do. This is our activity. We can renew the mind by putting off and putting on. And sticking with the football analogy, we take off that old uniform and we put on a new one. And we do this in the spirit of the mind. This means we lay down our desires and our opinions for the desires and the opinions of God. And this is hard work because we have a preference for our opinions and desires. But the problem is our desires, feelings, and opinions are corrupt, right? If we really want unity, we have to have a preference for God's way and his purposes and take a mental stand against ours. And the work is done within our desires and it's done within the mind. And we have to take off the old uniform and put on the new one. And we have to do it again and again and again, repeatedly, checking our desires and feelings and opinions in the mind. Here's a question that you can ask yourself that will help you do the hard work of putting off and putting on. It's a single question that will help you actively build unity. Are you ready? Here it is. Ask this of yourself. Am I seeking my will? or am I seeking God's? Am I seeking my will or am I seeking God's? That's it. I would recommend asking this of yourself sometime today, maybe a few times. The next time you get a little fired up or emotional or you see disunity on a team or in your family or on the news or in a business, stop and ask yourself in that moment, am I seeking my will or am I seeking God's? And if you are seeking your will in any way, then do this, put off, and put on, put off and put on, that's it. And get unified, struggle for unity. Get unified under God's will and be part of the unity that we so desperately need in this world. Well, that's it for this time, guys. Until next time, remember, live all in for him who lived all in for you.